Hey math friends, I know how frustrating it can be to see the same problem solving struggles from your students day after day, especially as we get to crunch time. As we get closer to the end of the year, we really hope that students have those strong problem solving habits that we want them to have, but a lot of times they don't. So what do we do when we're seeing those same mistakes over and over? That's what we're gonna talk about in today's video. I'm Brittany Heggie, the math obsessed educator behind Mix and Math, and today we are going to address the three most common problem solving struggles I see from students, the teachers in our communities receive from students, and what we can do to kind of address those struggles. What are activities or strategies that we can try that will get students beyond those struggles and into finding some really good success with problem solving in the classroom? So, if there is one mistake I see all of the time, it is number plucking. Now, I'm not sure if you've heard of this term. Honestly, I don't even know where the first time that I heard this term was, but number plucking is when a student reads a word problem, you know they have not had time to actually think about what this word problem actually is saying, and they just pick out the numbers and choose an operation and solve. That is number plucking. And I see this so often in students that we have to address it. So what are we supposed to do when we have a student who plucks out the numbers, chooses an operation, and begins solving? Well, of course we can remind them to use the problem solving strategies, go through whatever process it is that you've taught students, and you know we can continue to encourage that, but that does not mean that they will necessarily follow those directions. So what can we do? Well, one thing that I have done that has been really, really successful is using numberless word problems with these students and really with all students. Numberless word problems are fantastic. So numberless word problems are essentially word problems without the numbers. <laughs> they don't have the numbers. They have no numbers to pluck, which is a great problem to have. So I actually first saw this strategy being used in lower grades and I actually think that's a great time for students to be using numberless word problems because we want students to get in the habit of thinking through what is the problem actually asking? What's happening in the problem? How can we show this mathematically? And so a lot of times they're used in lower grades to teach the operations. Well, I started using them in upper grades because as much as we want students to have that understanding and to come, with, come to us and have these wonderful problem solving skills, we know that's not always the case. And so the way that I use them in my fourth and fifth grade classrooms is I give them to students and they read through the problem. They think about how they would solve it if there were numbers. And so there's several reasons I love numberless word problems, but the discussions that happen when you are using them are fantastic because it's not about solving, which is really nice for students because it takes the pressure off of getting the right answer it gets them to focus on the problem itself. It gets them to focus on understanding what is actually happening in the situation. And that is really powerful. And so the more students see, or kind of go through the process of thinking through what's happening, happening, um, you know, just working through understanding the problem, the more they do that, the more likely they are to stop number plucking later on. So when I am starting to see that number plucking is just a really big issue in the classroom, I will start giving students the problem first without the numbers, making sure students come up with a plan for how they will solve it, and then I'll give them the numbers for them to carry out their plan with. But starting with those numberless word problems is a great antidote to the number plucking problem. The second struggle or frustration I see with students in problem solving is the completely unreasonable answers. I know you've had those students who have solved a problem, they've done all this work, and then they have this answer that is completely unreasonable, and a lot of times they'll just leave it. They don't go back and check their work, they don't go back and rework the problem, and so what do we do with those students who have these unreasonable answers? Well, one thing that I have found to be really successful is to actually give students a word problem, give them the answers, and not ask them to necessarily solve the problem, but to figure out which of the answers are reasonable and which of the answers are unreasonable. This is actually a really good test taking strategy that I've given students, especially when we are working on end of grade tests and they are multiple choice. It's a really good habit for students to get in to look at these multiple choice answers and immediately eliminate ones that are completely unreasonable. A lot of times you can get a whole lot closer to the answer or actually get the right answer 
just by eliminating the unreasonable solutions. Now, you may think, but isn't that teaching to the test? Well, it's really not. If you think about, you know, doing a DIY project and you're going to Lowe's and you need to find a piece of wood to, let's just say, like build a mantle, because that's something we just recently did. We recently redid our fireplace and our mantle. We are not DIY people, but I spent a lot of time at Lowe's. And so if I go to Lowe's and I'm looking for a piece of wood, I don't have exact measurements. The first thing I'm going to do is immediately eliminate all of the sizes that I know would absolutely be too big or too small. So that way I can focus in on just the ones that are even reasonable. And so this is a problem solving skill that we use all the time in life. And so there's nothing wrong with teaching students that same strategy, both for the test, but problem solving in general. Obviously, when students are problem solving, we want them to estimate before they even get started so they know what is reasonable and what is unreasonable. But if students aren't estimating, the least they can do is check their work afterwards. And so giving students the opportunity when we give them the word problem and solutions, giving them the opportunity to assess which of the solutions are reasonable gets them in the habit or at least gives them practice for making sure that their own answers are reasonable later on. This also leads to really great discussion. You can put up a word problem on the board and have students discuss in their small groups which of the solutions provided are reasonable, which ones are not, and give students an opportunity to share out in the class which ones they thought were reasonable and why, and which ones they thought were unreasonable and why. And of course, you'll have groups with different answers. You'll have some debates there, but that is wonderful. That is how students learn is through that discussion. A lot of times, some really good information comes out of these discussions that builds students' understanding beyond that single problem. So if you have two numbers in the problem, and we are, of course, we're working in upper elementary, so these are positive numbers, say we are supposed to be adding them together, well, some students may connect that and say, well, this answer is not reasonable because it's less than the amount that we started out with. Here we are joining two positive numbers together, and so we can't have an answer that is less than one of the groups that we're adding. And so not only are we getting them to think about this idea of you know, what's reasonable, what's not, we're also allowing them to make some really important connections between actions and operations as well. All right, let's move on to our very last problem solving struggle, and this one's a big one. It is the reliance on keywords. Now, our hope is that by the end of the year, we have broken them of this habit. But if they have been taught keywords for two, three, four years leading up to your classroom, it's kind of hard to break in just a couple of months. Now, when it comes to problem solving strategies, I really feel like there are two camps here in the math community about keywords. Some teachers are adamant that keywords are helpful and it's a tool for students to use, while others say that they simply are unreliable. I am in the camp that they truly are unreliable. We have seen problems that have keywords that, you know, indicate several operations, or there are problems with no keywords. A lot of times when students are problem solving in life, there isn't an opportunity for a keyword. They have to think about how the situation relates to, you know, kind of what you would do mathematically. And so keywords just are not a solid strategy to teach students and really it hinders them from being successful problem solvers. So what do we do when it's late in the year and students are still relying on keywords? Well, one thing I love to teach students is key actions. So there was a great book that I read a couple summers ago and it talked about how Actions indicate operations. I'll actually link that book below in the description because I can't remember the name of it right off the top of my head, but it talked about, you know, the relationship between the actions and the operations. And of course, we there are word problems that are non-action word problems, especially when we are comparing. I'm planning to do a video on action word problems versus non-action word problems in situations later. But for now, the majority of the time, our actions indicate our operations. And so when we give students that kind of verbiage and we teach them about that, it's kind of an easier transition from they're using keywords and we tell them not to, to we're, they're using keywords and okay, instead of using keywords, I want you to focus on key actions. So when I say key actions, what I mean is if we are joining or combining something, that is typically an addition problem. If we are you know, sharing something evenly or we are measuring something out, that action, mathematically, we show that with division. 
And so getting students to focus on key actions in their word problems and looking for those is really helpful because that really helps them take the situation, help them understand what's happening, and then translate that into um, you know, math number sentences. How do we write that? How do we work that out? How do we solve it? So that is a really great strategy for kind of getting students to move away from relying on keywords to focusing on those actions. One activity that I absolutely love for getting students to focus on key actions instead of key words is a word problem sort. And so with that, you give students the word problems and you have them sort them into four categories based on the action that they are seeing happening in the word problem. And so I like to have students do this in pairs or in groups of three, because I think there's a lot of discussion that comes from this. And we know that there's a lot of value when students are talking about math. And so you can just take a piece of tape, put it in four quadrants on their desk. And so they have those four categories. We've got addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. We talk as a whole group about which actions are connected to each of those operations. And then students sort the word problems based on those actions. And after they have them sorted, again, we have a whole class discussion about how did you sort them? Why did you sort them? What actions are you seeing? Why does this action go with this operation? It's just a really great activity. If you're wanting to get students to move away from relying on those key words, the key action problem solving sort is actually a fantastic activity for them to do. So there you have it. Those are the three most common problem solving struggles I see with students in upper elementary and then three solutions or activities for you to do with your students to kind of combat those struggles. I would absolutely love it if you let me know in the comments which of these three strategies you've used with your students before and seen success with, or which of these three you're gonna take into your own classroom and start using with your students to combat some of these common problem solving struggles we see. So will you be using numberless word problems or will you be giving students an opportunity to analyze the reasonability of their solutions by giving them the word problems and giving them the answers and letting them have those discussions? Or will you be getting your students to focus on the key actions rather than relying on those keywords? Each of those strategies are just so powerful. Really, I've used all of them with students, um, but I would love to know which of these is your favorite. If you're looking for more strategies or ideas about how to build your students' problem solving skills in the classroom, I actually have a wonderful problem solving freebie for you to download. I will add the link to the description of this video, but there are just some wonderful activities in it as well as a free problem solving workshop that you get immediate access to when you download the freebie. I hope this video eases some of the stresses that come with problem solving with students in upper elementary. If you like this video, please subscribe to our channel so that way you're notified of any new videos that are released, but also share it with a friend. If you have a math teacher friend who is struggling with these same things, which I can bet you they are, I'm sure they would love to have these strategies to try in their classroom with their students. Don't forget to download the problem solving freebie and I can't wait to talk math with you again soon.